Hello there and welcome to the latest episode of Live Music and Me, a series of video shots where we talk to some friends and musical connections about their gig memories and some stories around that. Today's guest is the writer, cultural commentator and host of the great podcast Scotch by Hay, Alistair Braidwood. Hope you'll enjoy this one. All the best now. Hi Ali, how you doing mate? I'm good, but how are you? Uh, I'm very well, very well, thank you, very well. Are you ready to do live music with me? Yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. It's brought back lots of memories, which is a really good thing. I hope I hope that is a good thing. We'll, um, we'll, we'll find out for sure. Okay then, let's kick off. Um, so, first gig that you went to? So the first gig was one of two days, I guess, and nights that Simple Minds did at Ibrox back in 1986. Okay. Um, the, the day I was there, it was um, Intu and You, our Irish band were first, then Hipsway, then Water Boys, The Cult, and Simple Minds. And, you know, at least Simple Minds, The Water Boys, This Is The Sea, Hipsway's debut album, The Cult Love, these were all favourite albums of mine at the time, so it was almost like a kind of fantasy lineup that they put together for me to go along and see. And it was and it was a sunny day and it was it was the perfect kind of first gig, if you like. Yeah, I bet it was. And big crowd as well, if I remember it was packed, wasn't it? Yeah, they were all sold out. So yeah. I can remember running across the pitch to kind of get the what was really interesting was at the time the cult were a real cult band, you know, mm. they had a big falling but very uh, uh, uh intense if you like and there was loads of goths there. Okay. And when the cult finished, suddenly there was this gap at the front because they were only there to see the cult. They weren't bothered with <laughs> a simple line. So, and then no, it's all these kind of folk dressed in a midsummer day, all in black, kind of went, right, we're done. And so we were able to get closer <laughs> to the front. Which is a Very shame good. because Simple Minds were, but everyone that day was absolutely brilliant. Yeah. I actually missed that because, and I should have been there, but we were actually in Ibiza on a sort of prearranged holiday with, pals and stuff, you know, you, you're with your mates and me, the booked this holiday from ages before, and then they announced the gigs and we were right in the middle of the holiday, so yeah, we all missed it, which was um, was a shame. But a cracking and first the alternate, gig. the alternate day, if I remember rightly, instead of the Water Boys, or maybe instead of the Cult, it was going to be Lloyd Cole. Lloyd Cole, that's right. That was yeah. the other one, but apart from that, so that would have been great as well, another fantastic uh, band and Rattlesnakes, another fantastic oh. album, but mm -hmm. it was a great day, uh, it was a great first gig. Yeah, and uh, I think the, the, the weather was favourable, I think. Yeah, I remember. It was, yeah, uh -huh. Which it was is in unusual. June. It was in June, and yeah, we were lucky to. I mean, I think I was there stupidly dressed in like espadrilles, <laughs> and you know, like on a pitch, on a grass pitch, and on my feet were flooding by the end of it. <laughs> and we had to walk from Ibrox to Anderson Bus Station. I lived mm. in Campus Lang at the time, so I had to kind of, you know, quite a distance to get home, but with a smile on our faces. Yeah, absolutely. It's cracking first gig, mate. Okay, um, the last gig that you went to. So the last gig was at the Glad Cafe, which I'm living in the south side of Glasgow now. It's just not far from me. And it was Kirsty Law and Aurora Engine. Um, Kirsty Law is, oh, how would I say it? It's folk music, but there's electric guitar and there's a lots of, she's in a folk tradition, definitely. But she plays around with it quite a lot. Yeah. Um, so I've seen Kirsty quite a few times over the years. She was the support. Aurora Engine, um, it was almost... Kate Bush, this was the first time I saw her play, and um, I think her first name's Rebecca, apologies if it's not that, but um, there was harp, there was um, piano, there are, uh, yeah, it was an amazing piece of music, her album's coming out very, very soon, right. and uh, okay. it's, a, it's fantastic, she's originally from Newcastle, but she's living and working in Edinburgh now, and yeah, lots of really interesting influences, great voice, um, yeah, I highly recommend checking out Aurora Engine. And I do like those smaller gigs these mm. days. We'll talk about that later on. But, uh, you know, it's, um, and, and I see, because of Scots We Hay and what I do, I see kind of more local bands and more Scottish bands than of I course. really Absolutely. Yeah. And Glad Cafe is a cracking venue as well. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Yeah. absolutely brilliant. My memory might be going here. I think that might have been Ken McCluskey's last gig as well. Oh, really? I think. It certainly was at Glad Cafe. Um, and I'm pretty uh -huh. sure it was the same um, double bill. So I need to check that uh, one. Check it out, yeah. Very good. Um, okay, so a gig that most surprised you, good or bad? Right. So this was one I kind of, well, a lot of, it depends what you mean by surprise, you know what I mean? I mean, I, I went to see uh, Grace Jones at the Barrowlands, not knowing what to expect there. And she came down this huge staircase. <laughs> I mean, I never, wow, that was something. But 
I thought the one that really surprised me because it I wasn't I didn't realize it was going to happen was PJ Harvey at the Battlelands in 1995. It was the To Bring You My Love tour. So mm -hmm. it was all she was wearing the, the green dresses and the, uh, all, really theatrical. But the support was tricky. And he just released Max and Kay. Okay. We were there, myself and my friend Peter Mackey Burns. And uh, we didn't realize he was going to be the support. So this is amazing. He just basically played Max and Kay, the album. And it was mesmeric. It was just fantastic. And then in the wait between that and a PJ Harvey coming on. There he was at the bar beside me ordering a pint. He wasn't, yeah. you know, backstage having the, the kind of yeah. rider. It's just and he wanted to see it from the thing. So we were able to say that was amazing. And he was quite a shy guy. And he was like, oh thanks very much. And yeah. We didn't understand our thick Glaswegian accent. <laughs> well he maybe thought we were kind of having a go at him. But uh, yeah, that was a that was a really great surprise. Yeah. Uh, such a, an amazing uh, performance of someone that we just had no idea he was even involved. Yeah, it's been a bit of a recurring theme. I think it's one of my questions about support acts, and I think everybody who's come on has talked with some real emotion and love about a band that they kind of stumbled into and, have, you know, ended up having a sort of lifelong um, sort of love affair with. Um, and that's a great example of it with Tricky. But what I will say as well, another surprising gig also involves Tricky, and it was years later at the Arches in Glasgow, and he came on stage and played the whole gig with his back to the audience. The All whole right. thing. I really like, what's going on here? But, yeah. And it was in pitch dark as well. It was just, yeah. it was one of the stranger gigs. And particularly when we'd seen him so vibrant and, you know, really yeah. going for it. I don't know where his head was at at that time, but the audience were not happy by that. No, I bet they're not. Mind you, I've seen Jesus Mary Chain do that. For certainly for most of the gig. I've seen them play yeah. with their back to the audience and... You know, that that's became almost a thing with them, wasn't it? It, it was did, yeah. A of honour if you went to see a <laughs> chain. Very good. Um, sorry, sorry. On you go. not on you go. No. I'm going to say another one then that just, just jumps to my mind now was Mark Lanigan was playing at okay. Orin Moore. Mm -hmm. You know, I loved his music. It was Halloween. And he came on stage in a screen mask, you know, one of those things, and started the set. And everyone's like, oh. This is funny. And he kept he refused to take them off. And people were shouting at him from the audience, take the mask off, take the mask off. And he just refused to do it. So that oh, was very a good as well. Brilliant. Crackers. Okay. Um, so what about the first gig that you went to with a partner? Yeah, this was a, a one because obviously it was not yesterday. <laughs> so I to back to gigs I went with with a partner and not just a group of us, you know, which no. is what kind of usually happens. Like a like a date gig, that kind of right. idea. And yeah. I think it would probably be a uh, Brian Ferry at the SECC, right. and I think it would have been around about 1988. And um, I was going out with a girl called Jennifer Forbes, who I still in touch with today, and we used to go to gigs that my pals would not go to with me, you know what I mean? So Ferry was probably a good example. George Benson was another example. Okay. You know, that yeah. kind of so maybe yeah. kind of more a mainstream, perhaps mainstream, that kind of thing, which I loved that. You know, I love music from across the board. Sure. I'd always, I'd been a big fan of Roxy music and I was a big fan of Brian Ferry's solo mm -hmm. music and so was C. So that, that was a great gig. It mm. was, um, gosh, I can't think, Bet Noir was the album that came out. That he All was right, okay. Good. Yeah. So it was when it was the very glossy pictures and videos yeah. and that kind of, kind of real lounge lizard stuff that uh, yeah. Ferry did. And he's what? a good example of someone who you might, or I might not agree, perhaps with some of his standpoints, but I still kind of love his music. Increasingly yeah. that becomes the case for a lot of artists that you go, I wish you hadn't said that, but I can still like their music. That's like the Morrissey test, isn't it, really? Yes, and that's exactly what I'm thinking <laughs> about the Morrissey test. And, yeah. and you say your friendship is, is uh, endured? Well, not in Germany, we went away, but kind of recently um, she's come back up to Scotland, so we're going to take some touch, which has been good. Excellent. Okay. What about a, a great gig that you had a ticket to but missed? This this, this still hurts me, David. Oh, this, hurts me. this would have been my very first gig, and it was you two at the Barras in 1984. Okay. <laughs> right. And so I was 14, so fairly young, but... Um, and I had the ticket for months. And of course, being someone that didn't really bother about school, I mean, I wasn't great at school. Right. I hadn't realised that my physics prelim exam was the day after. And there was no way my parents were going to allow me to go to a gig at the Barras and then, you know, have an exam the next day. 
Yeah. So I had to sell my ticket on to someone else. Oh. And I can still remember I got 19% in my prelim. So it was <laughs> <laughs> But maybe that's maybe that's more you would have got if you oh, went to the gig, you know. I think I would have done better if it <laughs> like, would have been inspired. But um, because yeah. that was the time when you two obviously they were just kind of really starting to break it big. Yeah. Found they were, they were a really raw, almost still an interesting band. Um, yeah, that would have been that would have been. I think that must have been Unforgettable Fire tour, roughly about that time. Yeah, I've actually never seen you two, and I, I had a ticket to see them. I think it would have been the tour before that because I think they were playing Tiffany's or somewhere like yeah, that. That's right. And I was yeah. ill, uh-huh. and um, I literally was ill in my parents' house and just couldn't go off the couch and had to give my ticket away. Uh, and I've just never got back to see them again. So. I I've know. seen them a few times, um, but of course nowadays it's all. I saw them at Parkhead, mm. a which was, oh, uh, would that have been acting, baby? Maybe the Zootropa tour, Zootropa tour, and then I saw them at the Hamden um, a few years ago, and they're still great gigs and really innovative gigs, but I don't like that size of things. Mm. I'm standing at Parkhead on the halfway line, mm. no matter what they're doing, you know. You just, I saw Prince at Parkhead, for instance, and in yeah. theory, that me, could have been too. a great yeah. you there. So, mm. I mean, amazing to see, but just too far away, and he's little to begin with, you know. <laughs> Mind you, I saw Prince a couple of years after that when he was going through his slave phase, yeah. and he played a whole gig of new, new songs in Manchester. Wow. For two and a half hours. Yeah. And we were a lot closer, but didn't know any of the songs. So. Didn't know uh, any of the songs. <laughs> okay, so what about a bucket, a bucket gig in the past that you wish you were at? Well, I recently went to see the 40th anniversary re-showing of Stop Making Sense for mm-hmm. Talking Heads. You know, 40 years, I couldn't believe that. I remember getting that album for my Christmas when it came out and just playing it and playing it and playing it. Loved it, and I still love it. And I think I would love to have been in the audience yeah. For that gig, to that the filming of that, because um, yeah, it's just it's an album and a performance that just still means so much to me. Yeah, agreed. It's, it's wonderful. And did you see the trailer that he just did recently for the the fortieth reissue where he goes to the dry cleaners and gets his suit back out and stuff? Yeah, oh, it's very clever, right? Yeah, fantastic. And I went to see it at the GFT the, the reissue, and it was like a gig. Mm. And, uh, the only time I think that's ever happened to me before was the opening night of U2 Rattle and Hum. And we went to the ABC, me and my brother went to the ABC. And yeah. that was similarly felt like a gig as well. Yeah. As a live yeah. And of course, we, we take him to Scottish, don't we, David Byrne? Of course. Of course Here's some carry on. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> a tick. Uh, the, the other one I thought of actually was when I was young, I was really into my metal when I was very young, kind of, you know, eight, nine, ten, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. And I would love to have been at the ACDC gig at the Glasgow Apollo, which they yeah, filmed. The film, and they had the Scotland strips on, yeah. and all that stuff. That looked amazing. That does look amazing. Yeah, I've never saw them. I was a bit of a sort of rock, rock fan, particularly Rush, when I was a bit younger. Um, and I saw them at the Apollo a few times, which was great. But um, I never saw ACDC. Um, yeah, that, that looks amazing. Um, so maybe you touched on a seller on there. So the best support act that you've ever seen? Yeah. So this could have been tricky quite yep. easily. Um, but then I was thinking um, another one was the Lightning Seeds were playing uh, King Tut's um, in 1995, and but we went to see the support who was Terry Hall. Okay, uh, it was it was amazing, and I think every kind of aging skinhead in Glasgow <laughs> you can touch for that night. It was uh, it was amazing. But actually, the one I'm going to go for is a. My brother's a massive big country fan, like huge big country fan. Yep. And a few, he lives up in Braemar now. Uh, he's got a, a gallery up there. And a few years ago, big country as they are now, came up to play. I can't, it was some kind of festival that was on, but they put up a big marquee tent and big country were going to go and play. So Andy was just blown away by this. And, and then they didn't have a support. So they asked, Andy was playing in a covers band at the time called Bingo Wings. And they asked them to support them. (laughs) So (laughs) they asked them to support. So I was standing, you know, here to my window away from the stage. My brother was on stage playing his music. And then he came off and the two of us together, arms around each other, watched Big Country. Now, of course, Stuart Adamson wasn't there, as we know. He passed far too young. But even then, to hear those songs Mm. that were a soundtrack to us growing up, 
that was a very special uh, uh, day for everyone. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, and they're doing a, a crossing tour at the moment, or just about to do it, aren't they? So yeah. um, I was lucky enough I've to see them. I've seen them live since. They're, they're still a great live band. Yeah, I was lucky enough to see them back in the day with, with Addison and what have you. And um, I've actually got a story in that on our podcast. That was one of mine about missing the last bus or train home. I uh, went to see them at the Barrowlands in Hogmanay. That that's another gig I would love to be at because we had that on cassette. It was that's right, yeah. Oh, well, we were at that. Yeah. Was test was that right? Uh, uh, was I think, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, rock around the clock or one of these things, yeah. and uh, yeah, that just looked. It incredible. was. It was amazing. Yeah. yeah. What what I remember of it, I was glad the cassette was was there to to watch it. You know, <laughs> <it> was a bit. <laughs> but that's the thing when you ask me to look to think about gigs. I'm sure there's many that have unfortunately dropped off my memory mm. banks for all sorts of reasons. Yeah. And, you know, because going through it, you were going, oh, yeah, I went to see them there. Oh, I went to see a lot of gigs at nightclubs, like the Tunnel and the Sub Club, which kind of I of forgot course. about. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. It's half the, half the fun, I think, is that recollection, isn't it? Um, Definitely, we, yeah. we, there, there's Some great memories come with it. What about one that, um, that made you miss the last bus or train home then? Oh, this is a great gig as well. And again, one looking back, you think, was I really there? <laughs> So it was in Edinburgh, so that's why we got the bus through to Edinburgh, and then we did catch the bus back, but unfortunately that meant we missed the last bus from Anderson back to, to Canvas Lang. Yep. But it was Terms Trent Derby, supported okay. by Butchford, 1988. Okay. And myself and my good friend Colin Johnson, who's still a best pal to this day, um, we just obsessed over the Terms Trent Derby album. We just thought, yep. we loved our soul music, and this seemed like the most genuine modern record, you know, mm. reconstruction of, of Motown or Stax or all of those things. This guy just seemed like a superstar from the moment he stepped on stage. Mm -hmm. He had a great backing band. We thought, when he comes, we've got to go and see him. We'd missed him in Glasgow the year before, so we're going through to Edinburgh to see him at the Playhouse. And then, I've again, support acts. I've never seen Roachford. Yep. I've heard of Roachford. Mm -hmm. And he comes out with a key tar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which dates it somewhat, <laughs> uh, and uh, and does cuddly toy That's and right. oh, yeah. it, did, oh, it was it was fantastic gig, really brilliant gig. But then I got back to Anderson, had to find a payphone and get my dad at his bed to say, "Could you come and pick us up?" <laughs> <laughs> because uh, because we are stuck and the buses are gone and we can't afford a taxi. And and did he come for you? He did bless him. He did. Yeah. Him. He did. And I didn't do that to him very often. I have right. to say. So, uh, yeah, he did. He, he got up and come and got us in his pyjama. Good stuff. For cracking. What about a bucket gig that maybe you're still waiting to go to or hoping to go to? Uh, oh, Somebody I'm not sure. That's a good That's a good one. Who would that be these days? Uh, well, I think it might. Well, it, it's, this f follows into an, al uh, an artist that I will talk about a bit later in terms of live albums. Uh, and I know he can be very hit or miss, but I went through a period of absolutely obsessing over Van Morrison. Mm -hmm. And I'd never seen him live. Mm -hmm. So no, if I got him in the right, either. if I got him on the right night, then I think that would be great. If I got him on the wrong night, a bit like Dylan, you know, I think, you know, you go along with Dylan and you yeah. take your life in your hands. Yeah. You know, that would be, uh, but those, that would be two kind of legends that I would, uh, yeah, probably loves to see. Yeah, but um, but again, I miss the Cramps. I'd love to see the Cramps playing live. Yeah, uh, loads of bands from back in the nineties that just there was just too many of them to kind of catch up with. John Welsh, who does uh, our other podcast, um, John's a huge Cramps fan, um, huge, and we always have this rolling conversation about great live bands and stuff like that. And I never yeah. saw them either, so. Yeah. They, they were amazing. What about um, the gig that you travelled the furthest to get to? Well, yeah, I, I I lived in Australia for a while. I went okay. to a few gigs in Australia, uh, so that was quite a bit of travel involved mm. there. Uh, but I, I'll I'll talk about that gig in particular later. The one that really stands out for me was Pulp uh, in two thousand and two released an album called We Love Life. Yeah, love it. And they did. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. brilliant. Amazing. Kind of underrated, I think, you know. Mm. Yeah, it was the last so record as well, wasn't it? I think it might have been, yeah. yeah. I think it might have been. And they did a series of gigs in collaboration with the Forestry Commission. Because right. on the album, there was the song Trees, if you remember I rightly. Yeah, the did, yeah. So up in Rose Isle Forest, outside of Elgin, we all went up to see this. Again, it was a bit like a dream. You walked into this gloaming, I believe it's called a gloaming. <laughs> and, uh, and here's the stage set up, and here 
Pulp played a fantastic set. Yeah. In, and it was midsummer again. So, you know, it was a beautiful evening. We were lucky. Really lovely evening. And of course, it was full of people from Glasgow, full of people I knew uh, that had traveled all the way up to see them. Yeah. But, um, uh, yeah, that was a, an amazing night. Absolutely. And, amazing and night. were you camping up there? or how, how so, uh, A friend of my brother's lived in Elgin. Okay. Uh, Shandy. I think he still does live in Elgin. And uh, so we were able to kind of go back and crash at his. Yeah, because as we'll hear when we talk about festivals, I'm not a massive fan of camp. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm looking forward to that. We Just to bookend that, we managed to see Paul put Transmit this summer. Ah, right. Um, which was, a, a, that's another podcast, really. But um, but it was wonderful to see them again. And, mm. and still, still fantastically good. What a live band. And, and Jarvis Cocker, just such a great front man. Again, Amazing. talking about Terms Trent Darby having this kind of charisma. But I mean, he looked like he's come straight from Hollywood or whatever, whereas Jarvis looks like he's come from Sheffield. <laughs> but, hey, I've got the charisma as well. Absolutely. Um, so what about the band or artists that you've saw the most? So until I started doing Scots with Hay, I think I would have said Primal Scream. Okay. I've seen them all over the place. Again, a band who could be unbelievable and sometimes can be not so brilliant, depending on the, on the yep. gig. But in recent years, it would be local bands that I've been to see a lot, mm -hmm. you know, to either review for things or just support. And that would be bands such as Starry Skies, mm -hmm. uh, Broken Chanters, another mm -hmm. one, Carla J. Easton, seen many times. I like, like Carla. You know, loads, loads of people like that. Okay. That's, and it's great. And I know you're a huge supporter of the the sort of Scottish music scene as well. And there's some cracking stuff going on out there. Oh, it's amazing. Wonderful. I'm just blown away. I was talking to uh, David Lang, who's an artist from Gurek, who's releasing his second album this year. And he's released his first one about eight years ago. And him, he can't believe the time's gone, but it, you know, it's kind of disappeared. Mm. And he was just saying how much more music, great music, but how much more music has been released now as compared to when he released the debut. Yeah. You know, it's astonishing. And it must inspire them, I guess, to, you know, there's an element of competitiveness, I guess, about, you know, hearing other great music and trying to then better that by doing something yourself again, you know? I think inspire them in a really positive way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, this stuff's really good. And if I want to be heard, I've got to be good as well. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, so what about um, the best music festival you've been to then? Right. So I'm not a big <laughs> festival fan, I have to okay. say. Um, so I'm going to go with the Triptych Festival. Do you remember that in Glasgow? No. It was so. It was a kind of shoot off of. I'm sure the T and Triptych was like the tenants T. So I'm going to say it was uh, aligned to tenants when they were really starting to up their game in terms of doing music coverage. Okay. But it was held in the tramway and various venues mm -hmm. around Glasgow. Mm -hmm. And it was almost all kind of electronic and experimental music. And I had a wee Google before we started talking to see the bands that were playing. And some of the ones I saw included Moon from Iceland, uh, Fortet, Animal Collective, Explosion right. Sky, good. Yeah. Liars. Uh, great performances right around. And I got to go to my own bed at the end of the night. <laughs> so... <laughs> I'm really not a, a huge festival fan. However, the Big Day Festival was the one in Sydney. Yeah. And I did go to that. And of course, the weather was great. And yeah. that, you know, I could kind of go, yeah, I could get along with this. <laughs> <laughs> a tent, you know, you could just kind of fall asleep on the grass. Yeah. And I was, again, I was looking at the, the bands that were on that day. What a lineup. It was Elastica, Billy Bragg, the Dirty Three, the Jesus Lizard. Um, there was Rancid, who I'd never seen before, and were amazing. Right. Yeah, American punk band. Yep. I missed the day before Nick Cave. Oh, yeah. Since he, I've, I did see Nick Cave at the Barrowlands though right. during the Henry's Dream, and that was almost one of my top gigs that I, I could have mm. mentioned. I can imagine. Yeah. I can imagine. I'm mean, I'm going to see Bragg next month. He's touring, um, playing Usher Hall. I think he's playing Edinburgh. So. 40 years of doing what he's done. So. Uh, I saw him. A... Big Bragg fan. About six years ago, and just mm. a sensational again. He did the three and night again, thing. At, he did the three night thing at St. Luke's um, two or three years ago, and that was wonderful. We went to all three nights. It was, um, yeah. it was really good. And when I, one of these musicians who kind of changed my life when I saw him, it might have been the Gold Grey Whistle Test, just him and the guitar and these songs that were almost poems. Yeah. And to realize, wow, anybody really can do it. It was almost like my punk moment to go, yeah. well, like anyone can really can do that. Yeah, I agree with that entirely. So what about um, your favorite live music venue? Well, these days it would be the Glad Cafe. One, 
it's a great venue mm-hmm. and it's five minutes from my house. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think you're getting the picture. Of, I Absolutely. Like, yeah. I, I, uh, I think before that, in the 80s and 90s, it was probably the Barras. I was there okay. a lot. I was lucky enough that a good friend of mine did a lot of catering for bands. She went on tour with them. Mm-hmm. So when she was in Glasgow, she was catering that band. She would get us on the guest list. Right. So I saw so many gigs, great gigs in the 80s and 90s in particular. Yeah. And the Barras has come up quite a lot. Um, particularly yeah. for the guys, you know, the sort of um, Glasgow sect, if you want. But um, we're, we're just I do like it. These days, I could like a small venue, you know, yeah, like, yeah. like Hug and Pipe's another great mm. place where I really like Fantastic. to go. I do like to be able to get in there and, you know, look into the eyes of the band almost, you know, that yeah. kind of... I think the BMX Bandits are playing the Hug and Pipe soonish, um, which we're hoping to go to, because Goliath supporting them, uh, and we know Goliath, he's, um, he's one of our big, we're big fans of Jack and all that stuff. Yeah, so, yeah. I just met him, at the, I was at a gig... Uh, the Quitter album launch. It was right. again at the Bad Cafe. And uh, Jack came up to me and says, hello, I'm Goliath. And I recognised him from of playing course. him on radio and things. Yeah. So we got to have a bit of a chat and he said he's supporting uh, Douglas and the BMX Bandit. It's yeah. a great thing. It's fantastic. brilliant. Yeah, fantastic. And of course, Douglas is a big supporter of um, of kind of new music and stuff as well. So a couple to finish. So your best ever gig. I think that must have been Bowie at the SECC. And that, uh, it's not my favourite venue. I guess, ideally, you might have liked to have seen him in a smaller space, but he did what I said he played. Played all the big hits. Played fans' favourites, like, five years. I was there with a group of pals. We were almost all in tears watching this (laughs) play. You know, uh, yeah, that was just sensational. It was just sensational. Was that that the only time you saw Bibi? That was the only time I saw him. That's right. Wow. Yeah. So, to yeah. see him at all was just meant mm. the world, you know, mm. just meant the absolute world to see him. And uh, I, I think that was it. I mean, a, a couple of others that did spring to mind were Amy Mann. I saw at King Tut's. Yeah. I mean, I was a big Amy Mann fan. Mm-hmm. To, so I didn't ever think she would maybe come over and play. She's since been over quite a few times, but mm-hmm. this was uh, the first couple of solo albums and that was great. And going back to Primal Scream, seeing them at the Barras, and it was the Give uh, give Out But Don't Give Up tour. Yep. So they were still big from Schema Delica, so they played all the hits, and that was a really special night as well. Yeah, three crackers, but Bowie's, you know, you're absolutely yeah. right. You just tip your hat to him, don't you? Oh. I mean, Sadly I missed. Sadly missed. Oh, so your last one is uh, one live album that we should all own a copy of. Well, I've mentioned Stop Making Sense already, and I think that probably would have been my uh, number one choice of this. Um, but so I'm going to go for the Van Morrison album, uh, which is It's Too Late to Stop Now, Volume One. Okay. Uh, recorded in London and LA in 1973. It's Van Morrison at his very best. And uh, yeah, it's an album I played over and over. It's a great live feel to And the audience are really involved in it as well. And is that kind of Astro Weeks, Moon Dance, that, that kind of stuff? Yeah, it's all yeah. the kind of, it's when he was really kind of getting, uh, yeah. back in the early 70s, you know, when when the, when he was releasing, you know, bands, certain bands go through periods, uh, I'm thinking of the Smiths at the beginning now, where everything they release is just mm. absolute gold. Mm. And I think Van Morrison was going through that period at that time, when all those yeah. early albums are just sensational. As you said earlier on, it's about separating out the art from the artist, doesn't it? It's... And it's not, not that easy, right? No, it, sometimes it's not that no. easy. But I, just as a final thing, I was going to go right back to my early heavy metal days. The first single I ever bought was a live version of Motorhead uh, over the top with Motorhead on the other side. And that album, Motorhead, No Sleep to Hammersmith, mm. what a live, that mm. really captures what a gig is like if it's a yeah. Motorhead gig. It, just, it even sounds loud on the record, doesn't it? It's a... <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're always going to put your, your protectors in these days to listen to the oh, album. Brilliant. That's uh, it's a great way to finish. Uh, Alistair Braidwood, thank you very much for your time, mate. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure, Brian. Cheers. Thanks again. Cheers.